Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Sharp. And thank you, everybody, for showing up early for uh, this virtual lecture. I really appreciate it. It's a subject that uh, I have a lot of interest in. Um, as Dr. Sharp said, uh, my name is Eric Varley. I'm a fellowship trained spine surgeon, uh, new at Ortho Arizona with uh, interest in uh, MIS or minimally invasive and uh, complex uh, spine surgery. And today I'll be talking to you all about uh, cervical spine injuries in the athlete. So as far as my disclosures go, I have none. A little bit of background on me. Um, I was born and raised outside of Chicago. A lot of good things come from there. The Bears, the Cubs, deep dish uh, pizza, which is very low in calories, and uh, the Blues Blazers, of course. Uh, there we go. Uh, out, outside of Chicago, spent a lot of time in Michigan, and that is, in fact, where I spent all my summers and did some work with the Amish, who uh, maybe got me a little bit interested in some of the carpentry aspects of uh, orthopedics. As far as my education goes, I uh, went to undergrad in Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo College, medical school in South Florida at Nova Southeastern University. I uh, spent a little extra time uh, with the NIH, uh, really focusing on scoliosis and complex spine uh, research over a period of three years. Uh, then did my residency in uh, Grand Rapids, uh, followed by a spine fellowship in uh, San Diego, which I finished in 2018. And just a few personal interests. I like uh, snow skiing, and I was kind of impressed by some of the, the, the snow we got up in Flagstaff earlier, which was great. Uh, my family and I like rafting, uh, trail running, and uh, camping, which uh, Arizona is great for all those sorts of things this time of year. And this is just kind of a little look at all of us together and family's the, big, the biggie of all the hobbies that I have. A uh, little extra background. Um, I do do some work internationally, uh, particularly in Uganda and Colombia, and uh, do some lecturing over there. And these are some of the little guys that we took care of on my last trip uh, pre-COVID. So as far as uh, a little bit more in terms of my personal interest in, in uh, surgery, uh, non-operative and just general spine care, MIS uh, surgery, pediatric uh, spine surgery, and a lot of athletes, particularly the adolescents, you know, there's this very interesting bridge between transitioning from being a child to an adult. And it's, uh, it's, uh, they've got interesting anatomy and interesting uh, pluses and minuses to doing surgery on them at that age. Uh, as well as complex spine surgery and uh, revision spine surgery. All right, so today, what is our agenda? Uh, look at some of the basic epidemiology of a spine, particularly cervical spine injuries in sport. Uh, look at some of the unique biomechanics and some prevention strategies. Uh, talk about the differential diagnosis. It's pretty broad, so we'll stay a little focused there. Get into the more common things like st uh, stingers, and then just kind of go down the severity list into uh, fractures, spinal cord injuries, and then really get into return to play and the evidence or lack thereof supporting it. And then I'll uh, boil it all down to some take home points. So let's talk some spine. And let me just, all right. Okay. So from an epidemiology standpoint, just the rate of sports participation, particularly in the U.S., is you know, dramatic. Uh, in 2013 and 14, which was uh, one of the last chunks of data I could access through the National Spine, uh, Spinal Cord Injury Statistical Center, we had more than 7.7 .7 million high school students, 460,000 uh, college students participating in sport, and particularly in collision sport, more than 1.1 million high schoolers and 70,000 uh, college students. Uh, and spine injuries in sports, it's not a small number. Uh, 9 to 15 percent of all athletic injuries involve the spine, and it's a very common um, source of disability in this group. In terms of spinal cord injury, which is always the big scary one that we, that, uh, you know, that, that we focus in on, it's not overly rare, but when you work through the numbers of people participating, it becomes a larger number. So spinal cord injury in general is about 40 cases per million Mar Americans, or about 12,000, a little more than 12,000 cases a year. In terms of uh, where it's represented, and this is looking at all comers, not just uh, those in the athletic age, it's fourth in line between, uh, or behind motor vehicle accidents, falls, which you see a little more with the elderly, violence, and then sports injuries. 
And when you look at less serious spine injuries, in particular stingers or burners, which we'll get into a little later, up to 70% of college students um, report experiencing a stinger or a burner within a four year period. Um, and when you look at um, people that are actually hospitalized, specifically within the athletic population, um, about 2.4% of those uh, injured athletes are hospitalized due to fo some form of uh, spinal cord injury. Sorry. There we go. Getting in the anatomy of the spine, and I won't belabor this too much, you know, the spine, the spine is a, comp a complex series of joints with the cervical spine, uh, you know, looking at the most cephalad aspect, having this natural lordosis, your thoracic spine being more kyphotic and your lumbar spine being more lordotic. It's supported by intervertebral discs that acts, acts as a cushion, as well as uh, these small facet joints um, on the posterior aspect of the spine that further contribute to um, stability and can be a source of instability uh, when fractured. Furthermore, the spine has got a very complex series of muscles. And this slide really illustrates that when you look at the, at, at the length, for lack of a better, better term, or the, the, the muscles that originate in the pelvis, you know, they insert all the way up to the base of the skull. So spine-related pain and given the, 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 the spread, if you will, of uh, muscular attachments, it's very broad and it encompasses muscles that, you know, really start all the way from your pelvis and can impact you to the base of your skull. Getting a little deeper, looking at the nervous system, and this is, you know, one of the areas that we're all concerned about when we see an injured athlete. You know, the spinal cord, again, originating at the uh, base of the brain and running the entire length of the spine, um, throwing off nerve roots in the cervical spine, thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine, which is grossly summarized here. Uh, when we get into how we look at the spine from an injury standpoint, and honestly, how some of the, the, the research models that we use when we're investigating the nature of spinal injuries, we really talk about a functional spinal unit, or FSU, which includes two vertebral bodies, an uh, intervertebral disc in between, the facet joints, again, on the back of the spine, uh, or posterior aspect of the spine, and then the ligaments and muscles that, that uh, support this entire structural unit. So let's get into when we talk about a spine injury. You know, really, this is a huge spectrum and it's a very big topic. So cervical spine injury, you know, we're talking about everything to some soreness, you know, in the posterior aspect of the neck, all the way to, you know, quadriplegia or severe spinal cord injury. But regardless of whether you've got, you know, a massive or catastrophic spinal injury or something minor, you really want to go through and ask yourself a series of questions when you're evaluating that athlete in the acute or in more of the office or hospital setting. First question, what is the mechanism? You know, how did this person get hurt? The mechanism can tell you a lot and can tell you some concern, can kind of point to you what areas you might be concerned with. You know, someone spear tackling versus someone in slipping, you know, slipping and falling on their back are very different mechanisms, but both can happen on a football field. But knowing that mechanism is really important. Ask yourself, what part of the spine is infected? Are they complaining, if we'll just talk about the cervical spine, pain more at the base of the skull, the, the middle of the neck, or that, you know, upper, lower cervical, upper thoracic area? All those areas have kind of their own unique concerns. Ask yourself, what tissues are predominantly affected? You know, are they complaining more of a muscular issue, like, you know, their trapezius muscle is sore, or is it very, very focal midline pain um, with bony tenderness? And then ask yourself, what individual characteristics um, does that person have that, in that impact their uh, vulnerability to a specific injury? And what I mean by that, you can do something broad by saying, well, they're a, a, a collision athlete, like a football player, and that sets them up for certain injuries to the neck or just thinking about them in general. They're a very you know, thin female uh, who comes in with chronic neck or low back pain. You know, these, both of these groups have unique characteristics that you really need to consider when you're thinking about how to best treat them or get them into the, or route them to the right area um, of evaluation. So when we get into soft tissue injuries, uh, often, uh, this is a result of indirect loading, which is the most common mechanism. Um, you can also see this uh, with, uh, with high energy injuries. So kind of that flexion distraction injury of the spine. Uh, 
And then, you know, chronic injuries. So sustained high breath rep type of injuries. You see this in rowers, runners, things of that nature. And then there's a different group. It's, uh, you know, you talk about other mechanisms. Uh, another way to look at it is high energy. Now these are more rare and tend to be more catastrophic. And they're associated with violent rotation, a bending mechanism of injury, and can often occur with a bone or a disc injury. And it's important to keep that in mind, particularly when again, assessing that mechanism of injury. And then finally, chronic or repetitive um, type of uh, injuries. Again, somewhat covered under indirect loading, but you see it in these endurance athletes. And as more people produce and endure, or excuse me, uh, compete in endurance sports, it's something else to just be aware of. So looking at um, joint injuries within the spine, uh, the cervical spine is somewhat unique. You can see a, uh, you know, a, um, an image representation here. Representation here. Uh, looking at the posterior aspect of the cervical spine, you can see on this particular image on the right, the articular, articular pillar and the facet joint carry uh, a fair amount of force and a high degree of axial load, and they're vulnerable. So when people talk about the, the, the term jump facets, or you know, a articular pillar injury, what they're really referring to is these small joints in the back of the spine and the bone that support them, and they're vulnerable. And they're, it's certainly worth looking at at x-rays and particularly at CT scans. Um, and if you look at the size of the cranium relative to the cervical spine and the axial forces that get transmitted through it, um, it's not surprising that there's a fair degree of vulnerability to the segment of the spine. Uh, we also look at the, uh, the thoracic spine, you know, we'll touch on this briefly, where there's a rib cage, which adds an increased stability. You can see injuries in rapid flexion and extension, but of the areas of the spine, this is the least uh, commonly injured in sports. And then lumbar facets, uh, most common, it's a low back issue, uh, and uh, often a result of rotational forces. So looking at... Um, uh, mechanisms of injury and injuries uh, to the associated uh, bony anatomy. Uh, you look at it from terms of uh, energy distribution. So high injury, high energy, you're looking at direct injury and destabilization and then indirect uh, injuries. So one example is clay shovelers, which you see up here on the uh, top right. Um, this is where you see a spinous process uh, fracture and you see it with people with heavy, uh, heavy uh, shoulder sports like golfing, rock climbing to complain of pain, they don't really have any traumatic mechanism of injury, but you get a CT scan and you see it. And it's really an indirect injury just from the muscle forces transmitted to this segment of bone that you see with those aforementioned sports. Also look at pars interarticularis uh, injuries. And you can see here in the lower image, this is the lumbar spine, but it's a good picture because you can see the pars is that piece of bone that connects the superior facet and inferior facet. And when these are inj injured in the uh, athlete in the lumbar spine, we've got a series of options as far as treatment. And similarly, in the cervical spine, there are these pars interarticularis uh, bony structures. And it's important to note in the cervical spine that if you get a report that describes a pars interarticularis injury in the cervical spine, that is a, a big uh, do not return to contact sports until it's evaluated and possibly treated. Um, but if you hear a PARS injury, whether it's in the lumbar spine and the cervical spine, it certainly warrants further, um, further evaluation. And then we get into other stress type fractures in the lower uh, uh, lumbar spine and sacrum, again, from repetitive impact loading seen in volleyball players and runners. So the big scary, uh, as we like to call it, spinal cord injuries. Um, the incidence of these vary drastically by uh, anatomic region, most commonly seen in the cervical spine. Uh, the, the mechanism that we often see is an axial load for, uh, applied to the cervical spine with either a flexion or extension uh, component. And it's important to note that sports is the second most common mechanism of spinal cord injury in patients under 30. And like we talked about before, it's the fourth most common um, mechanism of uh, injury for all comers. So it's a fairly frequent uh, cause of the somewhat rare um, pathology. And uh, stay tuned, we're gonna get into a little more detail of that, um, but hopefully not too much, a little bit later in the talk. So 
where we talked about before asking the area of the body that the that or the area of the spine i should say that the athlete is injured and each area of the spine has its own unique uh, concerns so focusing in on the uh, cervical spine it's relatively small small from a bony standpoint compared to the cranium uh, when you look at stability uh, the osteoligamentous structures provide about 20 percent but 80% really comes from those strong anterior and posterior uh, neck muscles that support the structure. Uh, mechanism of injury, initially it was thought that the rotation of the head or the amount of force applied to the head um, was greater than the spine range of motion, and this could result in bony or ligamentous injury to the spine. However, this theory has been revised and was uh, published in, in the uh, mid-90s, and it, we now look at it more as a buckling phenomenon. So forces um, applied to the spine um, are distributed based on the complex shape of that spine. And there are areas of the spine where there's areas of pure compression on the bone, compression and flexion, um, and comp compression and extension. And there are different regions of that spine that experience these different forces. And it doesn't take much for these forces to disrupt the cervical spine. And indeed you can see just 16 kilograms of mass traveling at 3.1 mill, uh, millimeters per second is enough to disrupt the cervical spine. But again, that disruption is more mediated, we think, through this buckling mechanism as opposed to all the force goes to one area due to one movement. It's more complex than that. When we compare that um, to the thoracic spine, one reason we don't see as many injuries is a, the rib cage kind of acts as a fourth column of the spine, giving additional uh, support um, and adds torsional power for throwing type activities. And then the lumbar spine, um, you can see issues with, you know, chronic overloading and spondylotic change. Acute lo uh, loading can lead to compression or burst fractures um, and sports injuries and de uh, destabilizing, destabilizing spine fractures are often a little bit less common as a, a source of, um, of uh, pathology in this group or in this region of the spine, excuse me. So cervical spine injuries, again, uh, this slide just goes to, it just goes to, again, emphasize huge range of pathology. So first, when you're evaluating the, uh, you know, the, the, the athlete on the field, you want to, again, observe that mechanism of injury. It can give you a lot of information. And if you're seeing them after they've been seen on the field, that mechanism of key is key. It's important uh, to understand that athletes with loss of consciousness, acute mental status change, they are absolutely presumed to have a cervical spine injury until proven otherwise. Uh, and once you see an injured athlete, it's important to follow the neck pain algorithm, which is this uh, next slide here. Um, this is from the American Journal of Sports Medicine. It's a little bit of a busy, of a busy slide, but you, when you look at it, but the big questions that you're asking is, are they, are they having neck pain and are they having extremity symptoms? And I highlight this uh, little area on the, uh, on the slide because if the athlete doesn't have neck pain, but they are having extremity symptoms, that really lines up more with a um, brachial plexus, a neuropraxia, or a burner or stinger. But it's, it's important in this group also to ask, are they experiencing diffuse pain or are they experiencing pain that they're like, yeah, it radiates along a specific um, dermatomal distribution of the arm. But if the examinee is having neck pain, if you look at these other, um, um, if you look at this flow diagram and you look at the other possible diagnoses, neck pain immediately puts you into concern for osseous injuries, ligamentous injuries, and neck pain is when we take it seriously. So if you see a, a, an athlete and they're complaining of, oh, my whole arm is numb and it's a stinger sort of situation, but they also are complaining of neck pain that is far different than the athlete that just has that isolated diffuse upper extremity numbness and tingling. So if a structural or neurologic injury is suspected, again, immobilization, rigid collar and a backbone. And you wanna be working with a team that's familiar with log roll and those sort of techniques. You want the face mask removed for um, access to the airway and maintain the helmet. The big red, if you're in a collision sport, let's say, uh, big red flags are LOC, which is loss of consciousness, or AMS, or acute mental status changes, bilateral neurologic symptoms, a uh, focal spine pain or tenderness in the midline of the spine, and then if someone has got a low uh, Glasgow coma score of eight, this is often associated with a spine injury. 
and they might not be complaining of their spine, but if their uh, mental status is, is poor or they have that GCS score, again, of less than eight, immediately suspect cervical spine injury. So getting into the differential diagnosis, you, you know, you've seen the athlete, perhaps they're, you know, you're seeing in the hospital or maybe you're seeing in the office for follow-up. Um, you can see this table really lays out the diagnoses uh, on the far left and then some clinical examples on the right, kind of working through the table in, in, uh, in a stepwise fashion. Cervical spine sprain or strain, which is obviously one of the less serious injuries that we worry about. What you're looking for is an athlete that, that um, doesn't have neurologic symptoms. You can see circled here, more muscular tenderness, uh, range of motion is limited by pain. And then just, again, a normal neurologic exam is key. When you look at a cervical facet fracture, again, fracture to that posterior aspect of the spine, those important uh, stabilizing joints. One of the things that you'll hear is new onset that their, their head is stuck in a particular position and they cannot move it. Um, and you see, you know, neurologic symptoms are often present, but not always. And it typically occurs with a high energy trauma. And this is a big, you know, this is a big concern when you see an athlete's neck locked, lots of pain, plus or, lot, plus or minus neurologic symptoms. That's fine precautions and evaluation in the ER. When we talk about our slightly older athletes with degenerative issues, what they often complain of is axial symptoms. So just generalized spine pain that outweighs radicular symptoms. So they might complain of a radiculopathy of their arm and axial symptoms, but they don't really say that their arm is locked and it's more of a radiculopathy presentation as opposed to both arms are numb and they have some sort of a co uh, concomitant head injury. And then looking at cervical radiculopathy, dr dr drilling down on that a little bit more, Oftentimes when someone complains with a pure cervical radiculopathy, palpation of the spine doesn't reproduce pain. So if they're complaining of, you know, kind of pain in their trapezius and shoulder and it's diffuse and you're worried about the spine and, and it radiates into their arm and they're not painful when you touch their spine or really palpate that midline structure, that usually leads you more along the road for cervical radiculopathy type diagnoses. And then um, finally, peripheral nerve injury. This can be exacerbated by head position, but it's important to realize these patients generally do not complain of any neck pain, and there's no exacerbation of their symptoms with neck motion. Um, that's important to distinguish from cervical radiculopathy, where often if you flex their head and rotate it to the side of their extremity symptoms, they have worsening symptoms, where people with peripheral nerve injury, they really don't manifest that. It's, it's, it's more distal than that. And then um, while it, there, it's an interesting subject, uh, sorry, let me just get back in there. Um, uh, shoulder injuries, including rotator cuff tears, glenoid uh, uh, labral injuries, and glenohumeral uh, degenerative joint disease should also be considered, but are outside of the scope of this talk. All right, so uh, getting a little further into it. Burners and stingers. Uh, it's one of the most common uh, uh, spine injuries that we see, particularly in the collision athlete. So what, am I, what do I mean by this? So it really represents forceful contact, uh, contact to the neck or upper extremities, kind of as uh, de demonstrated in this diagram here, where you have a stretch type injury with lateral bending or a direct injury overlying the brachial plexus. It's typically manifests um, with temporary sensor or motor deficits to a single um, uh, extremity. If they complain of bilateral extremity symptoms, that's an immediate red flag for a spinal cord injury or an unstable fracture as opposed to a temporary unilateral symptom. Um, most common symptoms, sharp pain after the injury and decreased range of motion. Um, the motor manifestations of this, uh, it, it varies from just transient weakness or nothing at all, all the way to paralysis. And again, from a neurologic complaint, they're complaining of diffuse numbness and tingling down the arm, not necessarily in a radicular pattern. Um, as far as the duration, this can last from seconds up to 24 hours. And we see it a lot in our football players. Um, the NFL recruits uh, that, were, uh, uh, th that were evaluated in, in a uh, 2014 study reported that 50% experienced a stinger at least once in their career. So again, typical symptoms, it's unilateral, variable sensory motor deficits, sharp pain, often decreased range of motion, 
Um, and when we think about it, you know, you see this, you think this is what this is. Again, those big red flags to bear in mind um, include, sorry, um, fracture, uh, which will be manifested with neck pain, loss of consciousness, acute mental status changes, the ne neck held in a locked position, all the things we talked before. And then the other category that's at least we're touching on is vascular injuries. You know, the neck is highly vascular, vascularized and can often be missed. So if you see a patient that's, that's had a high energy injury and they're complaining of neck pain, but also dizziness, headaches, nausea or vomiting, changes in vision, or even stroke-like symptoms, a vascular injury is something to be concerned about and getting the appropriate imaging, whether that's a CT um, angiogram or excuse me, arthrogram uh, or an MRI, it, it, it's worth having on your differential because it could be fairly catastro catastrophic if missed. Um, if you see anyone with any of these symptoms, particularly these red flag symptoms, that's immobilization, C-spine precautions and evaluation in the emergency room. If you have those unilateral upper extremity symptoms only, again, without focal neckline tenderness, um, if symptoms persist greater than five minutes, take them off the field, worth it, getting them evaluated um, appropriately. And then if a, if a patient or an athlete is, has experienced more than two stingers in a year, again, indication, take them out of play, it's worth having them get evaluated because that can point to uh, maybe more of a structural issue. So diagnostics, diagnostics. Um, when do we do x-rays? When do we do MRI? Uh, it's important to bear in mind, looking through the literature, there really isn't a great consensus on this. And I wish I had better information to provide, but that's the best that we got. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's not indicated when you see an athlete with a first isolated stinger, again, unilateral, non-radicular arm pain, arm pain with symptoms that resolve within five minutes of the injury. However, it is generally indicated if you have symptoms of a stinger lasting more than an hour, it localizes to one nerve root. Again, that ridiculous type pattern of arm pain or neck pain um, with uh, a normal range of motion of the cervical spine. In other words, uh, they have neck pain just with gentle rotation. It's worth getting that, that, uh, that advanced imaging. Additionally, it's indicated again that more than two singer, uh, stinger episodes within a single year. Further evaluation in terms of EMG, um, patients with persistent neuromuscular abnormalities, and it's important with the EMG. This isn't necessarily a test that you pull the trigger on um, in the acute period. It's often um, it's best performed in two to four weeks when you see axonal damage, and you can perform it as early as seven days from onset of symptoms, again, with the idea of kind of isolating the location of the injury. Uh, but let me emphasize, not necessarily an acute study. So digging into the literature a little bit, looking at cervical spine stenosis and stingers and the collegiate athlete, this is um, 1994, uh, kind of seminal work. Uh, it was a work looking at 266 college players. And this is where the TORG ratio um, was really evaluated. And it's, it's demonstrated by this picture here. And really what you're looking at is the width of the spinal column um, divided by the width of vertebral body. And this is really asking, do they have a narrow spinal column? Does this set them up for having stingers? And what the authors observed is those that have a ratio of less than 0.8 had a three times higher risk of stingers than those that had a, a ratio greater than 0.8, suggesting that that narrow spinal ca uh, canal sets an athlete up for injury. Uh, a way to look at it in a little bit more modern context, again, that first day was in, from 1994, is this uh, very nice study performed in 2009 of 145 players. Again, looking at, at, the spinal, at the spinal canal from a similar concept. So looking at the width of the spinal canal and the subaxial um, cervical spine and the width of the spinal cord itself. So if you subtract the width of the spinal cord itself, from the uh, width, uh, and again, this is looking at it in the um, AP or AP um, uh, plane on a sagittal image on an MRI. If it's uh, less than five millimeters, it's an 80% sensitivity for uh, examining uh, being susceptible for a burner or stinger. And if it's less than 4.3 millimeters, it's a 96% sensitivity. And it's been shown to be a little more uh, sensitive than a TORG ratio. Um, in the non-spine surgeon's hand, if you have an MRI and you get it and you look at the amount of volume for the spinal cord and it looks relatively small without a lot of CSF, 
that should be a little bit of a red flag that the examinee is set up for possible spinal cord injury or at a higher risk uh, for a burner or stinger. Uh, now this is compared to, uh, and that was more focusing on the cervical spine. When you look at it purely from a brachial plexus standpoint, a uh, nice study done looking at EMG of uh, 261 military uh, football players sound, found that about half had EMG findings when they had a burner or stinger that were consistent with the brachial plexopathy. So in other words, they were consistent with the, with the brachial plexus being injured as opposed to the cervical spine. And so this kind of has generated the, the conversation in the community of, well, well, which is it? Is it you have spinal canal stenosis and that, that leads you to being more prone to having burners or stingers? Or is it that you injured the brachial plexus and that's the cause? And I think really what we're talking about is two separate uh, injuries that are, or etiologies of injury that are kind of grouped together. Oftentimes those injuries, the brachial plexus, not the cervical spine, but more um, distal to that, these are acute injuries and they're acute stingers. So direct contact right over that trapezius or brachial plexus region. Where it, whereas if you see um, patients with more of a chronic um, sort of presentation where they are having chronic stingers, a lot of times this results from degenerative changes or congenital narrowing of the spinal canal that sets them up. So both you could you can see patient, patients present as stingers, but the chronicity can give you some clues as to what's going on. And again, any concerns, MRI, uh, plain x-rays. So looking at this a little more deeply, uh, and again, we'll spend a little more time on uh, burners and stingers since they are so common. Uh, what do we do for treating these? 85% um, of people really don't get much treatment. You know, they don't miss a subsequent game in practice. And a lot of this is based on mechanism of injury and severity slash chronicity. Uh, mainstay of treatment, for sure, uh, it's not operative. So physical therapy, focusing on postural correction, normalization of strength and balance of both the neck and the shoulder stabilizers. And then there's adjuvant treatment. And this is a little bit controversial. Um, and we use it based on the mechanism, or we can suggest it based on the mechanism of injury. So an example here is a neck collar and neck rolls in football players. And it can protect the uh, athlete from having hyperextension to the spine. But remember, it also places the, the athlete's head in a slightly more flexed position. So if you've got a younger player that's spear tackling and you put them in one of these and it puts them in a little more flexed position, you can actually increase the risk of spinal cord injury. So understanding the mechanism of injury, understanding that particular athlete is important when even when evaluating these more um, or less evasive treatment regimens such as neck collars and neck, row, neck rolls. Um, I won't spend too much time uh, on the uh, more on the interventional operational side. Suffice it to say, that um, if you have an athlete that's having recurrent stingers, there is a role for epidural steroid injections, particularly targeting that level. Um, and you see this more in, uh, or you consider this treatment more in athletes with residual sensory symptoms or use it as an adjuvant to targeted physical therapy. So now an athlete with recurrent stingers, you're doing physical therapy, still having some sensory issues, this uh, injection strategy can be quite useful. And then, um, for any spine surgeons in the audience, um, operative treatment really re reserved for uh, uh, patients with more permanent or residual findings. You most commonly will see this at the C5-6 level. Um, and you consider such things as um, nerve transfers, which are now favored a little bit more over a traditional nerve graphing. And again, and this, this is more of a salvage type situation. This is not less about return to play, but more about return to function in their daily life. And the objective with all of this sort of treatment is to reserve, uh, preserve mobility or restore mobility of the muscles controlled by the injured nerve. Moving on, a little more exciting stuff, uh, to spine fractures. So, you know, a very nice paper uh, published looking at the uh, catastrophic injuries to the cervical spine in football players, again, about 196 high school and college players found that uh, injuries to the upper cervical um, spine are rare, but can have fairly catastrophic results as the paper suggests. The most common fracture that you will see in the upper cervical spine in the athlete are odontoid fractures, which you can see um, uh, demonstrated right here on the image on the left. 
So if you see an odontoid fracture, um, obviously it's a spine fracture, accessory neurologic uh, deficit. And then assessing stability is key. Is the fracture displaced more than five millimeters or is that, is that fragment angulated more than 11 degrees? If not, um, if it's less than that, typically that athlete can be treated in hard collar or halo. If it's unstable, it pushes you more towards odontite screw fixation versus posterior instrumentation. And there's some controversy here uh, on whether or not surgical fixation returns you um, to play faster in that gray zone of, you know, maybe four millimeters or eight degrees of angular displacement. But there really isn't a good consensus on this. And this falls more into a case by case basis in terms of what to do. Other injuries to the spine. So uh, injuries uh, to the posterior tension band. These are often that flexion and compression type injury. And frequently you'll see a teardrop fragment. If you see that in an MRI report or a CT report, what they're referring to, if you look at these uh, pictures in the uh, bottom right picture, is this little bony fragment, which suggests not only do you have an injury to the bone itself, but that the posterior column, those strong um, muscles and those facet joints in the back have also, also been injured. Um, one of the most devastating injuries is if you see bilateral facet dislocations. And if you look at the uh, top left-hand corner, you can see this facet joint that is fractured, resulting in a dislocation or subluxation of it, which is associated with 90% incidence of spinal cord injury. So again, seeing in the ER, if, uh, you see, if you see a report or you see imaging suggestive of this, very, very important to realize that their spinal cord is at risk. And of note, this is a, an indication for surgery in all athletes when you see a disruption of this uh, posterior um, ligamentous or bony structures in context of a neurologic uh, injury. Other type of injuries are more that what we think of those compression or burst injuries. So direct axial loading to the spine with the head more in a neutral position often results in an anterior um, column fracture and is not necessar necessarily associated with a uh, neurologic injury. So if you see that, that that anterior column is pressed down, but you don't see that teardrop fragment and you see, and you they examine he doesn't have any sort of neurologic issue and the posterior ligaments and the set joints look good, these compression fractures don't necessarily have a neurologic component. So it's, it's good not to be described by this. Where you see more of this, is in a more of a burst type pattern. And that's when you see the posterior wall dis disrupted. So if you look at this image, particularly on the far left, you see how this bony fragment is pushed posteriorly. That's when you see um, a higher incidence of neurologic injury. So, you know, you're, you, you see a patient, you see that they've got um, a subaxial cervical spine injury. It, this is a little more nuanced for the spine surgery um, attendees, or actually trauma surgery attendees, but to cite, suffice, it to, uh, suffice it to say, being able to communicate the nature of this injury is, uh, is very important. And that's where having a classification system is um, useful in being able to describe this injury and predict treatment. So this is called slick. So if you ever heard this terminology, what it's referring to is the subaxial injury classification system. And really what this is based on um, is work done in 2007 by a pretty broad uh, swath of uh, thought leaders in the spine trauma study group. And it really looks at uh, three main components. What's the morphology of the injury? And if you look <clears throat> under morphology, that unstable teardrop fracture is right up there as being in the most severe. What is the status of the disco ligamentous complex? In other words, you get an MRI, you look at the back of the spine, and it lights up, quote unquote, on the MRI. Are the ligaments disrupted? And the final component is neurologic status. Are they neurologically intact? And if you uh, add these point values together, if the point values are low, non-surgical, in the middle, indeterminate, and um, high, uh, surgical. But I really bring this up for the non-surgeons uh, in the group because what you're asking yourself is morphology, what's going on in the back of the spine from a discal ligamentous standpoint, and how's their neurologic status? Those are three key elements in evaluation. So moving a, a little bit deeper into uh, spinal cord injuries, you know, these are rare. 
but these are devastating and it's you know the big scary that we that that we all worry about um one of the number one things to bear in mind and and if we have any athletic trainers in the audience you know this is key this is where you or the ems providers come in big thing is cervical spine precautions if they have altered mantle status midline neck pain high mechanism of injury loss of consciousness full c spine precautions until proven otherwise because what we want to avoid is those athletes with an unstable injury that get further injured by virtue of the treatment they receive. So if you see any of those things, I can't emphasize enough the importance of cervical spine precautions in treating these patients. Uh, when they're seen in the hospital, and I'm not going to get too detailed into this, we do have a classification system, the Asia classification system, where we really look at neurologic deficits from a motor and sensory standpoint and which levels are involved. And for those um, uh, attendees that aren't necessarily in spine or trauma surgery, if you, you know, shorthand, if I could take home for all of this, uh, Asia grading, if they, you look at their muscle function, you look at their, their neurologic function, you look at what level is, um, is affected. And if you hear someone say someone's got an Asia E injury, that sounds bad because a E is worse than an Asia A injury, but that's not true. So if you hear Asia E, they're normal. If you hear Asia A, it's a complete injury. So just a little note for those of us that care for these athletes, the Asia system is used pretty ubiquitously. And oftentimes it is the, um, the, the oftentimes it can, it send people down the wrong ro road when glancing at a chart, because the higher, the, the further the letter is down the alphabet, the less severe the injury. All right. So this is a little bit target, more targeted at inpatient care. But one of the big questions uh, that then we don't necessarily have great definitive answers, but we ask ourselves is for patients with acute spinal cord injury, what's the role of steroids? Um, and this has been debated, it's continued to be debated. There are ongoing studies, but what we can say right now, and this is uh, uh, again from the spinal, Spine Trauma Study Group, uh, published in AO Spine in 2017, they looked at a systematic review of all the papers out there that met their inclusion criteria. And the things they concluded um, in their systematic review with use of, um, of uh, steroids, particularly methoprednisone sodium sustenate or MPSS, is there's no difference in motor score change at any time point when you use steroids. When you use steroids within eight hours, um, when you follow those patients six to 12 months, you do see a modest improvement in their mean motor scores in the story group, and that there's no statistical difference in the treatment groups, whether you got steroids or didn't get steroids and risk of complications. And that last point is important because oftentimes the contraindication for steroids was described as, you know, there are risks to steroids and, and there absolutely are. But when you look at it in the acute setting, there wasn't a big statistical difference um, at least in this systematic review and use of steroids. So something to be aware of. Uh, based on their systematic review, this, this panel of uh, experts uh, in the study group made the following recommendations. And these are suggestions with moderate to weak evidence, but again, this is the, kind of the best data we got. Uh, they suggest not offering steroids, a uh, 24 hour infusion in adults who present eight hours after sustaining the injury. They suggest that um, the uh, at athlete or injured adult do receive a high dose um, a steroid infusion if they present within eight hours of acute injury. And a lot of times that's the athletic treatment group or the athletic uh, population we're talking about. Uh, and then finally, they uh, suggest not offering a 48 hour effusion or two day effusion in adults with this acute spinal injury. So in other words, more steroids doesn't exactly equal better outcome. But if you see that injured athlete within the first eight hours and there's no big contraindications, it's worth considering um, beginning steroid management because, or steroid infusion for 24 hours because that eight hour time window evaporates pretty quick. So we talked a little bit about steroids. The other question, and this is a little bit more surgical, but again, important for ER providers or, or, or those providers in the trauma service is when do we do surgery if a patient has been determined to have an acute spinal cord injury and, and some compressive pathology? 
Uh, so this is uh, in a fairly uh, big journal, uh, The Lancet, just published in 2021, looking at about 1,500 patients from four big data sets of uh, spinal cord injury. And what the authors uh, found when they looked at these at two groups, uh, first group, about 500 people that got early surgical decompression in less than 24 hours, and the other 1,000 patients that got uh, surgical de decompression greater than 24 hours, is those that got early um, surgical decompression statistically had um, more improvement in their sensor motory recovery. And those that had surgical decompression in more than 36 hours really didn't see the improvement that those um, that had surgery in the first 24 hours. So when an athlete has a spinal cord injury, when we're, whether we're talking about steroids, um, which you want to get within the first eight hours, or surgical decompression within the last 24, hour, 24 hours, ideally, timing is critical, and these hours evaporate quickly. So if, seen, if these uh, patients are seen on the sidelines, seen on the field, seen in the emergency department, getting the ball rolling is really important in terms of affecting their overall outcome, or whether we're talking about steroids or we're talking about surgery. So return to play, which um, is always a big question in, in this patient population. So I'm going to kind of call heavily on this uh, article out of the Journal of Neurosurgery, which is really the most up-to-date evidence-based return to play guidelines um, I can provide um, looking at a consensus study through the Cervical Spine Research Society. Um, now, some of these slides are a little bit busy, as you can see, but I'm going to try and pull out just the recommendations that had a super majority and a strong consensus. So, sorry, let me get there. When we look at um, patients with cervical stenosis, again, that narrow canal, we talked about the TORG ratio or the spinal cord to um, spinal canal volume. So patients that, are, that have narrow, narrow or stenotic cervical spines. Um, so following an episode of transient paralysis, so more of a stinger, um, asymptomatic athletes that have an MRI performed and they see their spinal cord doesn't light, light up. Um, if they've got more than 10 millimeters of space, okay to return to play. For patients that have less than 10 millimeters of space, basically that should be evaluated by a spine surgeon and should be taken care of on a case-by-case -case basis. When we see similar athlete, transient episode of paralysis, um, and an asymptomatic athlete that has a resolved T2 uh, signal changes. So in other words, this is someone that got hurt had a transient episode of paralysis, had an MRI, saw the spinal cord light up, had a subsequent MRI, and that, that, that quote-unquote lighting up or increased signal um, has resolved. If they've got a, a spinal canal, canal diam diameter, excuse me, uh, greater than 13 millimeters, okay to return to play. Less than 10 millimeters, should not return to play. Again, evaluated by spine. For those um, athletes, this is a little more um, targeted to spine surgery um, uh, attendees. I'll try and be brief here. For those that have had um, a one to two level um, ACDF or asymptomatic with no cord signal changes, um, and that ACDF is solid on x-rays, they are allowed to return to play. Um, but they recommend in athletes that have had more than a three level ACDF or more than three levels fused, not return to play. Additionally, asymptomatic, excuse me, asymptomatic athletes that have um, continued uh, cord signal changes and MRI after fusion um, should not return to play if they have a two or three level ACDF. Um, again, anterior fusion of the cer uh, cervical spine, um, but a one level ACDF can be again determined on a case by case basis. And then finally, uh, asymptomatic athletes with a solid fusion after um, a compression fracture um, with no evidence of instability and no uh, T2 signal changes are allowed to return to play. Um, additional considerations in returning to play. Um, athletes uh, with prior non-op or op treatment for cervical spine pathology with a notable exception of a singer um, should absolutely undergo a screening MRI prior to returning uh, to a collision sport. And I would even advocate if you're unsure if it was a stinger or not, you know, they present with this diffused arm pain, but maybe some neck pain, 
worth getting an MRI to screen them out before returning them to a sport. So when in doubt, MRI, not a bad choice. And then athletes who are asymptomatic, uh, less than five minutes following a stinger are able to return to play. But those um, athletes that have symptoms lasting more than five minutes, and again, this is isolated, diffuse arm pain. We're not talking about people with neck pain or loss of consciousness. Um, so if they have those symptoms for more than five minutes, uh, it should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think generally the consensus expressed in this paper is they should get evaluated typically with advanced uh, imaging um, or at least closely monitored before returning to play. Wow. Uh, so that's a lot of information about the cervical spine and athletes. Um, I guess some of the main take-home points to keep in mind for, for the attendees is spine injuries in athletes are common. Uh, watch out for those legs, those uh, red flags. Do they have a head injury, loss of conscious, change of vision, bilateral symptoms, or unilateral arm pain that lasts more than five minutes, or two episodes of unilateral arm pain or stingers in a, in a, a period of one year? Beware, those are red flags and observe strict spinal cautions or restrict or restrictions on return to play. When we look at individual um, pathology, um, stingers, the majority are brief, less than five minutes in duration. Um, but if you have uh, a stinger that lasts more than an hour or is recurrent, uh, best to be seen and evaluated uh, prior to returning to, to play. When we talk about fractures, odontoid fractures, the upper cervical spine fracture is one of the most common fractures we see in the upper cervical spine. These are typically treated non-op, even though they have a spine fracture, many of them that are stable can be treated without surgery. And to keep in mind that slick classification system, which is again, looking at what is the morphology? What does the bone look like? It's looking at what's the back of the spine, that uh, disco ligamentous complex look like, and what is their neurostatus? Uh, and just pay very close attention to that mechanism of injury, um, as well as um, pay attention to the, the, that individual athlete as well as their neurostatus. A neck roll or neck uh, collar isn't always the right answer for all athletes, particularly if you've got a younger athlete that's a spear tackler. In regards to spinal cord injury, there's really no consensus on the use of steroids, um, but it's worth considering if they're, if they're less than eight hours after a uh, spinal cord injury. And for those surgeons in the audience or uh, you know, uh, ER staff members, early surgical decompression should certainly be advocated if they're less than 24 hours um, after injury as it's been shown to improve um, motor outcomes. Again, the big take home is that first eight to 24 hours is critical. So mobilizing your resources efficiently, very, very important. And then when looking at return to play, uh, getting an MRI is, is important. And if you see those cord signal changes with the narrow canal, that, that involves further evaluation and uh, consideration before returning to play. If they've had a fusion not and they're asymptomatic, doesn't necessarily mean they can't play if it's a one to two level fusion. So worth considering. But generally, if they have more than two um, levels, they're uh, suggested not to return to play in a collision sport. And then if you have a, uh, a stinger, it lasts less than five minutes, no neck pain, no concerning neurologic findings, no head injuries, less than five minutes, generally okay to return to play. If it's more than five minutes, in particular, if they have any of those other findings, um, further consideration and evaluation holding them back from returning to play um, is advocated. So, uh, the final caveat to all of uh, those return to play recommendations and treatment recommendations is a lot of this is based admittedly on level four and five e evidence. So expert opinion or consensus opinion. So, you know, these aren't necessarily absolutes and I wish I could give you better absolutes, but this is the best information that we can provide based on the level of evidence that we have available. Um, but again, it's limited. So that's certainly a limitation as we look at the recommendations uh, uh, and what we've discussed in this presentation today. So I just wanna say thank you to you all. I really appreciate everyone that attended today um, and I'd love to open it up uh, to questions.